and that, folks, is answer to prayer, right? It's 50 degrees out today. Yes. Wanted to start that way. It's an oldie but a goodie. I can't think I'll, I'll ever get tired of hearing that kid scream that when, when I'm watching it in the middle of January. So, hey, good morning. Thank you, worship team. Um, it was good to hear that God is faithful and that you are always by my side. How good is that? How good a news is that today? Let me pray. Jesus, uh, I ask that you do exactly that. Come and be by our side today. Holy Spirit, come. Speak through the words I say, but more importantly, Father, speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me start the story off today with a, uh, when I, a story about when I was eight or nine years old. Um, Mom came to me and said, what do you want for Christmas? And I said, I want a John Deere combine. I had all the tractors that I needed, and I had the implements that would go behind those tractors to pull and do all the things, but what I lacked was one thing, a combine, the missing piece that would make my toy farm complete. So this hope for a gift consumed me as I went led up to Christmas. I had done some research. I had guessed which boxes had which kind of things in it. I noticed that there was soft packages, socks and underwear, which honestly, parents, those are not gifts for, for Christmas time. This should just be completely eliminated. And then my brother and I decided there was a couple of boxes that had the highest probability of containing my combine. So on Christmas morning rolled around, I headed down the stairs um, to look underneath the Christmas tree, excited, sure that I was going to find the answer to my wish. Um, the, the, the brand new combine sitting in a box. I had unwrapped all the other gifts under the tree except for one last box. And as I pulled the paper off, I was distressed to find that it was not my combine. Mom and dad started asking questions like, uh, were you expecting something different? And of course I was, um, but I didn't want to disappoint, sound too disappointed. I said, well, I was kind of hoping for something different. And mom and dad said, well, why don't you go outside and see if Santa Claus had pop possibly dropped it when he was coming down the chimney? Now, at this point in my life, I was not sure what I thought about Santa Claus, and so I kind of found their coaxing a little ridiculous. Um, but I decided to go outside and just to humor them. And as I opened the door, I looked outside and found, sorry, this is not supposed to be important to me. Um, <laughs> I found a, a box wrapped sitting in the snow. That Christmas, I received a gift that was my heart's desire, but it certainly didn't come in the way or by the means that I expected it. Um, this morning, I, I, want to cho I chose a scripture that um, kind of shows the same picture to me in many ways. And I'm going to do something a little different, if you don't mind joining in on this one. Um, in China, we always would stand and actually read scripture aloud together. Uh, so if you, would, if you can stand, um, please join me, and we're going to read about 17 uh, verses together of a story from Acts 12, 1 through 17. And I'll not speak so I can save my voice. Here we go. I do that, sorry. About that time, King Hera Agrippa began a persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed earnestly for him. The night before, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, following the angel, but at the time he thought he was in a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. the city and this opened from all by itself so they passed through and started walking down the street and then angel suddenly left him peter finally came out to his senses it's truly true he said the lord has sent his angel and saved me from herod and from what the jewish leaders had planned to do to me when he realized this 
he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where they were gathered. Here. And now, a girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she realized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. Instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You are out of your mind, they said. She insisted. It must be an angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking while finally stood the door and saw him. They were amazed. He motioned for them to be quite down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what had happened. Good. Thank you. You may be seated. The church had been seeing some pretty amazing things happening in Acts. The Holy Spirit was showing up in miraculous ways, and Jesus' followers, despite opposition, were growing, and the future seemed bright. But at the start of this story, things were getting a little bit dicey. Their community had taken a huge hit as Herod had just beheaded James. This death accounted for one out of the three people that knew Jesus most intimately. Now Herod, uh, Herod had Peter in prison as well. The believers knew that Herod loved to make the Jews happy, and the Jews wanted nothing more than to snuff out this movement that threatened their very existence. So now they are seemingly, seemingly down two of the three people that were closest to Jesus. The stakes were high, and no human answers were to be found. They were aware of this, and so they turned to the only thing they could at that time, prayer. And not just prayer, but prayer, a heartfelt scream to Jesus um, to do something and step in. Now, I kind of wondered about this in verse 5 and 6. If I were in their shoes, what would I be praying? Do you think I'd be praying for a fair trial? Do you think I'd be praying that Herod would just have a big change of heart? Would I be praying that the Jews would change their mind? Or maybe that I was just praying for short-term solutions, like Herod wouldn't kill him on Passover and follow the law. Or maybe I'd be praying for the future and saying, we're going to counter losses and just move on and ask for help for what's going on next. Or maybe they were just so lost in the situation and they were crying out with words that, 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 that feelings that words could not express. No matter what their prayers were, I would guess they would not have considered to pray for 16, car, 16 guards to somehow turn a blind eye and allow Peter to walk out of prison free. The scripture doesn't really say, but later in the story, I don't get the sense that they were counting on Peter to show up or to be able to leave and expected his death in short order. But even with the odds of, of a favorable outcome being very low, they continued to pray. While this was all taking place, uh, Peter was being guarded by 16 well-trained guards that for fear of death would not even consider letting him out of his situation. This is part of where the goosebumps just start kind of coming up in my neck and in my arms. An angel wakes him up with a tap and instructs him to get ready to go to do something pretty miraculous. Walk out of prison untouched. Remember, he is chained to the next two guards beside him. As each obstacle presents himself, God answers. The guards are not aware of the man who is chained to them, getting ready to leave. The chains fall off. The guards don't see him. The doors swing open, and freedom comes to Peter. Peter is sure that it must be a vision of, because of how miraculous each step is along the way. But after, after, he gathers himself, he realize, after he gathers himself outside the prison, he realizes it is real. And he heads to find the group to let them know what has happened. I love the response as he knocks. Rhoda greets Peter in a strange way by getting so excited that she doesn't even let him in the house welcoming. So Peter still finds himself outside knocking, probably a little bit anxious to share the good news of what had happened and also a little nervous that someone might be coming back around and take him back to prison. All while the people inside the house are making excuses and won't accept the answer to their own prayer standing right outside their door knocking. While Peter, while, so while Peter is knocking, they're trying to come up with some rationale that would explain what Rhoda had observed. Peter is the unrealized answer to the prayers knocking at the door. Is it possible that there are unrealized answers to prayer knocking at our door today? I want to tell you about a story from someone that maybe some of you might know. Um, it happens to be Ingrid Smith's mother. Lois Smith was a small woman that taught my Sunday school class. 
I think she was 200 years old when I met her. <laughs> three-year-old, sorry. Uh, Lois modeled to our young three- and four-year-old classroom that the nations were important. Though she was not a world traveler, she would, not, uh, she would pray for the children of the world in the basement, um, just a few hundred feet away from where we're at today. She would entertain our questions in the Sunday school class, class about the nations. I remember asking her one time, but how will we tell them if she, they're so far away? She said something to the effect that, I'm not really sure, but let's just pray. Lois was committed to praying, even though she would openly admit she personally had no way of reaching them with the gospel. Now, let me fast forward in time, 30 years um, forward. Lois is now gone, and I'm standing at a gas... Lois is now gone, and I'm standing at a gas station in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, on Jefferson Street. I'm looking at two guys behind a counter carrying on a conversation in Arabic. When they both, and they're both from Yemen, they had migrated here for school, and now they own the gas station on the corner. And it hits me. Maybe this is Lois's doing. Maybe her prayers brought them here to have a chance to know who God is. Maybe all the faithful men and women that understand that God's heart is to be intimately known, prayed, and moved the hand of God in a miraculous way, doing something that no person could have ever dreamed of. Unfortunately, the U.S. has made this largely into a political issue and skewed what I think God might be doing. Remember, our allegiance first is to our heavenly king, who all, desires all men to understand his grace and mercy. Though governments need clear and fair laws, no matter what they decide, we are commanded to love one another. We often join conversations influenced by political leaders and are talking heads of our favorite news organizations. But I ask you to listen to the, to the conversation led by the Holy Spirit and by God's word. What is he saying? He has brought people from the most unreached and dangerous place on the earth to our country. I can now sleep in my bed in Huntington, Indiana, while being able to talk to the people the next day from places that have never heard the gospel preached. Folks, missions has come to us. So let me uh, look at scripture and see what it says a little bit about the foreigner, because um, I didn't know this not so, so long ago. This is a passage in Leviticus, and it says this, do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember, you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I'll leave that up there, actually. People in those days identified first as being part of a tribe. So today, I will use the Klein and the Getz tribe as my example. <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> um... Sorry, I lost my place. Ah, geez. Okay. Uh, at, in that day, your job as part of a tribe was to do all that you could do to protect and promote your tribe and your people, no matter what the truth of a situation is or the cost. So about a mile away from here, trouble is brewing on Klein Getz Hill. Ron is upset at Jill because his chicken somehow got out and he decides she is to blame. To get her back, he decides to let out some water from the Klein swimming pool with a sharp object. Julie, it, Ron's wife, if you don't know the situation, Julie is fully aware of Ron's actions. Now, in our culture, Julie would have a decision to make. If justice wins like we usually want it to in the West, Julie would somehow be a part of bringing help to Jill and letting punishment fall on Ron for his dirty deeds. But in tribal culture, Julie's job is a little bit different. Gassing up the lawnmower and aiming for Harold and Marsh's flower beds would, be, would teach those clients not to mess with Big G Tribe once and for all. By the way, this is a great Netflix miniseries. I think I'm going to write it. It's going to be fun. I'm going to make millions. So this was the context. It was gang-like. Your ID was wrapped up in how committed you are to your tribe. So this scripture, so for this scripture to dare say that outsiders should be brought in, trusted, cared for, defended as their own, is simply ridiculous, and maybe even felt like betrayal of their own family. And of course, we have a story from the New Testament of the Good Samaritan. An outsider, sworn enemy of Israel, extends love and compassion and saves the life of a man he, is trying, he, he should be trying to hurt. The scripture doesn't seem to be too unclear on this matter of foreigners, but that doesn't make it simple nor easy. Um, this sermon is not lost on me. 
I can, uh, can, can, I can become so annoyed when I walk into a situation and there are other languages around me that I don't understand and I, I get frustrated. I hate when I walk into a gas station and, and, and know as soon as I see the foreign owner, fo- foreign owner that the chances of the bathroom working and the pop machine are less likely. And I'm telling you, don't mess with my Mountain Dew. I know having friendships with someone whose first language isn't English takes a lot more time and can be frustrating. I know that having people in our community, or in different people in our communities makes for change and that we might not be comfortable with or ready for. Let's face it, I struggle at times to love people that I've known my whole life, let alone someone who is different than I am, and I have to go, that I even have to go out of my way to meet in the first place. Moving to China had effects on Melissa and I that I would have never even dreamed of. Uh, when we got there, the neighbor's dog spoke a whole lot more Chinese than we did, and we felt very alone. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> I, was, I was a successful human being in the U- United States, but now I struggle to make sense of even simple things in life. I didn't know the rules to the game, and not many people were interested in inconveniencing their lives to teach me, an old guy, who should have learned about all these things a long time ago. But thank God, we did find some people that were willing to make that sacrifice and reach out. These people not only became our support and our teachers, they became our friends. When Melissa and I were in tears because we couldn't read a simple note from our, our kids' uh, Chinese school, five minutes of help that Christine offered us felt like a valuable gift. My friend that helped me get through the red tape of getting a driver's license, I will never forget the freedom that I felt from his kind deed that he offered me. We had uprooted ourselves, and we needed people on the inside to usher us in, helping us plug into the culture, as well as making a mark on our lives that will never be forgotten. So now, living in, back in the U.S., when I see someone who is not from here, whether from a different country or a different county, I realize the power of simply extending a greeting and help. You gain not only a friend, you gain the trust to speak into others' lives. You earn the right to be heard. And most of all, these friends watch our actions, hopefully noticing that we are different in an attractive way. You make a way for Jesus' love to be seen and understood. So missions is right here in Huntington, Indiana. But this is a different kind of missions. Let me explain how I believe this is strategic in reaching the whole world. My friend is a banker here in Huntington. As you know, that Huntington is not large and predominantly Caucasian. Even when this being the case, two of our largest companies hire from around the world to get the skills they need. And when, they, when these people come to town, they have, need a bank account to pay, to be paid, and to live. My banker friend made a note of how reclusive of a life these people were living and how he was the one person that knew most of these people. I encouraged him to look at it as an ministry opportunity. With just a simple invitation uh, to the beginning, in the beginning to meet together, he soon found himself as one of Muhammad's closest friends here in the U.S., Muhammad is an engineer from Jordan, and as their relationship grew, my friend learned about his family back in Jordan while his family learned, or while his family learned about his new Christian friend here in the United States, in a dialect and through a cultural understanding that only a local could provide. My friend had influence that reached across the globe. And in the case, and in this case, as he later finds out, Muhammad is the brother of the chief educational advisor to the king of Jordan. The implications are pretty obvious. Muhammad has now returned to Jordan to live to, after he finished his contract here, but my friend continues to keep in touch with him via WhatsApp, an app on the, on the phone. Those will never replace some of the boots in the ground thinking that we are strategies we need for Christians to model their faith overseas. We all could engage in this kind of ministry right here in our country. Fort Wayne has been chosen at, by the federal government as a resettlement city, making it um, like many other resettlement cities around the country, the medium-sized cities. They are people from the Congo, from Syria, from Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Jordan, Burundi, Ar- Ar- Iraq, Somalia, Bhutan, Iran, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Eteria. Anyone got it? Anyone know where Eteria is? You win a prize. Okay, it's across the Red Sea from uh, Saudi Arabia, South Sudan and Sudan, with the largest population being from Myanmar and the Congo. Notice many of these places are dangerous, if not impossible, for a white U.S. passport-holding individual to go. 
but now they are a short car ride away living in our, or living in our communities. They are here. They came to us. They are an answer to our prayers knocking at our doorstep. And I'm, I am sure that the prayers were lifted up in the past. They had no expectation that God would move in this way. But now I hope we will have eyes to see what is doing. But what are some ways that we can answer the door, so to speak? I'm going to throw up a few things, and most of these things are things that I felt personally living in China. So here's just a few ideas. Offer transportation. Have you ever lived in America without a car? It's not a fun place to live, okay? So offer transportation to somebody. Help them with, to get a driver's license, my own personal story. Take them shopping or go to the grocery store. It's also fun to see what other people eat. It's like, it's kind of, it can be a lot of fun. You might enjoy some of it after some time. Open your heart to them, by, uh, to them being in your community. Just giving a handshake, giving a smile. Give, vol- uh, give or volunteer um, at LIM or IHOUSE. There's two organizations in Fort Wayne, Indiana that are engaged in doing this all the time and they connect people. These are great um, places to, to volunteer if you want a place to go. If you're a little, and also they offer training. So if you're going, oh, I don't know what to do, these people will help. Get acquainted with their hangouts. I know a lot of times I don't even see foreigners unless I intend to make my eyes aware of them. And so once you know where they're at, where they hang out, like Los Amigos, gosh almighty, I've gained pounds there. I'm a missionary. <laughs> so, but go where they're at. Greet them. Greetings are so important, different things. Give them a small gift. It doesn't have to be anything important, but just something small, just to show that you care. Uh, find a place to worship um, with them. So this could also be kind of tricky. Bring them here, great. But also, maybe at the first step is go with them to where they usually worship. So I, last two weeks ago, I went to a mosque. That's not my favorite thing to do. But I did it because I wanted to extend the, the love to this person to take them there. Hopefully understanding that why would this white guy who, who, who I know clearly is a Christian would take me back to somewhere where I worship. I know it's a little wild, but that's something that can really make an impact in their lives. Ask them for advice and learn from them. A lot of times we think we know it all. Matter of fact, I've learned so much by my Chinese cohorts about how to do life differently. Ask them some questions. See how they do it in their country. Celebrate holidays together. Um, I've, I love having a, a, a mixed holiday every year where we just open our doors at, at Thanksgiving and we have people over from all walks, races of life. It's a, it's a blast. So Pastor Rick got to be a part of that one time. I, I don't know if he, he liked it or not, but it was a, it was a blast. I had fun, I guess. <laughs> so invite them to your home. Let them see hospitality. Find co- common interests. I love to play sports, so sports are where I connect. Connect with sewing. Um, I know in Fort Wayne they do a lot of sewing clubs with people from different countries. So if you enjoy sewing, do something that you enjoy. Um, help them prepare their kids for school. Oh my goodness, getting ready for school for us is difficult. Can you imagine if it's a language you don't even speak? Uh, we've had this experience in Chinese. Help them out. Help them read their papers. Um, teach English. If you want to get more involved and you're a teacher, let them know our language. That will help them integrate to who we are. And study, um, study them. Understand what's going on. Uh, learn about what they're going through. These are just a few ideas. These are not exhaustive. But overall, the bottom line is, and to make this really simple, it's not working all once, be their friend. Just be their friend. So as I conclude today, I ask you, to give, um, ask you to ask God to give you eyes to see what he is doing in your community and world. Ask him to reveal those people in your community that might need to be served and cared for, no matter where they are from. His name is great and worthy to be praised and shared with all people. Let me pray. Father, let us know your heart in an intimate way. And let us see your hands and where they're at work. And then join you there. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have an exciting thing to do. That's something I'm going to start kind of semi bi weekly, I think, kind of thing. I will hope she's here. I, is Ashley here yet? Yes, she is. Sweet. Okay. Um, I want to do a missionary commissioning. So, Ashley, come on up. Um, you're probably scratching your head and saying, I didn't know we were commissioning a missionary today. And that's, that's good, because I didn't intend for you to know this. All right. Um, Ashley, come on up here. Uh, Ashley's going to do a couple things. We're going to commission Ash- Ashley, and I won't say that she's a new missionary, because I think she's been a missionary for a while here. Um, but first, I want you to just tell us a little bit about your current missionary field. Good morning, everybody. Well, as some of you know, I am a, a junior high special ed teacher. I work at Cherubusco Junior Senior High, um, and I work with kids in a resource room, um, grades six to nine, um, kids with learning disabilities, 
high functioning autism, kids that have emotional disabilities, um, and I just meet them where their needs are lacking in the general ed class. Um, so my staff and myself, we either plug into a class and support them, or they come into my room daily for a study hall so that we can give them the skills and the support so that they can do their best um, in the general ed class and, and to one day graduate high school. What are some specific ways that we can pray for you to be an agent of God's love and grace? So a lot of my kids are the kids that on face value are very frustrating to a lot of teachers. They don't do their homework. They don't come to class prepared. They um, can be noisy. They can be, they sit in their seat. Well, they don't sit in their seats. They're up, they're moving. Um, and just, they struggle. Um, they, they stick out sometimes. Um, so what I try to do is I try to give them the love and the support that they need. A lot of my kids, they need that extra, extra something every day, whether it's giving them the confidence to know that they can do it because they've struggled for so long. Um, and a lot of times my kids give up, so I'm there to remind them that they can do it. They just need a little extra help. Um, so prayers for myself and the, the ladies that I work with, but also for the general ed teachers to know that they can do it and that just to give them the extra patience, um, the extra support so that we can all work together to let these kids know that they're going to be successful and that they're going to do a great job and graduate from high school and and do great things when they graduate. Thanks. Let me explain myself a little bit so you understand what I'm trying to do here. A missionary is kind of a muddled up word. Um, people would always pray for us as we were sent out for missionaries. And man, you're a good thing. You're going to China and to the ends of the earth. Great. Well, well done. It struck me what she just described is just as much of a mission field. As a matter of fact, she's doing this 60, well, I'm, it's supposed to be 40 hours a week. I'm sure it's probably like 60 hours a week. I know what a teacher's life is like. She's doing this. This is where most of her influence is. And so I want to bring people in front of you guys that are, that are having impact in our world for Christ. I want you to know what's going on, and then I want you to join and pray for these people. So that's what we're doing today is we're commissioning a missionary. I'm going to muddle up the word a little bit here, but that's the intention of what's going on here. So would you pray with me for Ashley in her situation today? Jesus, uh, we, we don't send out Ashley for the first time because she's been doing this for a long time. But God, we ask today um, that you uh, specially touch her today and give her your strength and your power. Um, God, uh, I ask that in the school that you uh, make her a light and a beacon of light, um, an a, a honest beacon of light that's able to um, reach into the situations of each kid and each family and minister in a deep way. Holy Spirit, go in front of her and give her the words to say and know what to do next um, in so many probably tough situations. Also, just help her within her staff to be a, uh, a person of influence in her staff that people know who Jesus is because they know Ashley. Um, help her to be able to um, say the right words and also be quiet at the right times when that needs to happen. And help her just to make an impact that really is felt. Um, Jesus, we know um, that you go with us in all times. So just to remind that um, to Ashley day in and day out as she is ministering your name in, in Cherubusco Middle School, Middle High School. Uh, Father, we love you and thank you for going with us. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, thank you for saying yes. She said, I'll take any prayer I can get. So ask her how it's going. Thanks, Pastor Rick. Uh, for your Roanoke people, uh, Ashley Kidd is Turk Dennis's granddaughter, and um, so that might help you to know a little more about her. For you Andrews folks, she'd be Kyle Kitt's granddaughter, so I don't know if I need to explain any more about that if you know Kyle Kitt, um, but uh, anyway, it's so true that we don't have to go anywhere. I mean, the, these days, our, our mission field is, it's, it's still, it's really, it's right here, and we have to, you know transcend these these boundaries because even the next generation is a mission field because if you didn't know that they don't talk our language right if you're they, they don't they don't communicate the way we communicate and if you don't communicate on their level you won't communicate to them and um, really gone are the days when just open your church doors and people kind of flood in 
um, it's, it's not that way anymore. And so you have to build the relationships. You really do. And then the invitation. And so like next week, I'm going to talk about inviting care, accept, invest. So we invest and invite anyway, anyway.